So I'm just going to briefly introduce the panel to you, and then I'm going to let them take it away. Um, so we're starting with Jeff Murphy, um, fisheries biologist from NOAA Protected Species. Jessica, can you use the microphone? And, uh, I guess I can. Um, in Orono. Um, next up, Ron Beck, chief of the first Coast Guard District Energy and Facilities Branch, coming all the way from Boston to see us. Um, Jim Beyer, project manor, manager of Bureau of Land and Water Resources in the Eastern Maine region of DEP, Maine DEP. Um, and Linda Mercer, um, Director, Maine Department of Marine Resources, coming from Booth Bay. Um, so I wanted to, um, we asked the panel to address three questions for us. First, we wanted them just to tell us briefly who you are and what your role in tidal energy development is. Then to reflect on, sorry. Reflect on their experiences, what has worked well for them, what have been some challenges in the work that they do. And then lastly, just to give us some advice moving forward and perhaps we can take mixed lead there and just um, your advice moving forward and perhaps what MTPI can do to help you in your work. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I do consultations on the Endangered Species Act. And what that means as it pertains to this industry is I work with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to get these projects permitted. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The federal regulatory process is complicated, it's complex, and it's expensive. So while I'm not going to sugarcoat it, I want to tell you, I want to justify it. <laughs> not long ago, in the distance past, we had another rush to harness the power of our waters. And we made huge mistakes. Look at our freshwater rivers and, and streams. They're a mess. It was the Wild West. Whoever could put a dam in, put a dam in. There was no consideration for environmental consequences. <clears throat> These dams are in existence today. There are no fishways. The consequences are we've, we've depleted fish stocks. Um, um, we have species imperiled on the, on the brink of extinction. But as a nation, we learned from that. And in the 70s, we, we passed the Va National Environmental Policy Act. And in 73, we passed the Endangered Species Act. We looked back and we said, we made, we made many, many mistakes. And part of what I do today is, is, is working to remedy these mistakes. We, we still have many dams in our freshwater rivers without fish waste. Um, in, in the business model back then, I would say it was broken. Um, the, there was such resistance to do anything that was relatively good for the environment, for fish. And so today we're spending millions of dollars taking these, these structures out that don't serve any purpose. Um, um, we have anatomous fish stocks that are, that are depleted, going extinct, Gra ground fish stocks going extinct, uh, mm. being imperiled. Um, so, while the process is, is difficult, it's necessary. I, I argue that it is necessary, and, and it's improved. I, I would say that um, we had a good relationship with RPC. We, th this project is a success. It, it wasn't always easy. Maybe there were some delays, but we got through it. And, 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 and on a learning curve, that's a completely novel industry. Um, what I would urge you all to do is, is be less competitors and, and be more of a community. Come together, promote good projects, and, and identify and recognize that there are bad projects. There are bad projects being proposed to me. I'm not gonna go into any details. I think some of us know what they are. But work as a community. Don't resist doing good things, if you can do good things, if it's economical, if, if, so that the, the, we can, we can reduce the number of listed species we have in the state of Maine so we, we can promote the environment. That, I urge you to act more as a community because it wasn't a community back in the heyday of, of building dams and, and we're, still, we're still struggling today to remedy that. So again, it, it's a difficult, very costly process, but it's necessary. The wet blanket in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. Um, I want to start off by thanking uh, Jessica Gale and University of Maine for getting me out of my Boston office. Um, and my, 
I am predisposed to head north rather than south. My area goes from Canadian border down to northern New Jersey. And uh, Mick, you, you uh, made uh, reference to Cape Wind. I've got some scars on my back from Cape <laughs> Wind. And, and 12 LNG projects, including the three in Passamaquoddy Bay. And I have to say, this area, Washington County, uh, is a place where I expect civil discourse. And that, uh, that may, you, talk, you talk well amongst yourselves, there's information that's being transferred, so it's a pleasure to, to uh, come up here. Uh, one of the things that, uh, we, we're all in a learning pattern here, this is first, first steel in the water, other than Roosevelt Island, uh, this is huge, and it's huge for the area. It's huge for the people like me that have to try to figure out how does this work within the regulatory framework. And ORPC, we have a good relationship with ORPC. I really enjoy working with them. And they characterized, did a lot of outreach, characterized the waterway, and they said, trust us. Everything's going to be fine. Everybody loves us. And it turned out after we had two uh, meetings up here, pretty much the way it, uh, they said it was. But one of the roles of the regulators is to verify that. To not do that would be to do a disservice to the process and ORPC because you can say, hey, Coast Guard came up uh, along with the other agencies and we checked it and the waterway is as, uh, the use of the waterway is as it was uh, described by, by ORPC. Uh, I think the, uh, the main things that, I, I offer some encouragement because we've learned a lot with this particular project. And the second uh, very encouraging thing, last Friday we had a meeting that was sort of monumental. It was in Boston, 35 federal regulators got together on how to improve the process that you are all part of right now. And it's inconsistent with the national ocean planning effort that you may have heard about, coastal marine spatial planning. But the New England Federal Partners, which is a small group that uh, I belong to, are trying to avoid some of the, uh, um, I call them teething pains for a new project like this, like uh, ESA determination, uh, but first of all, let me start off. FERC has about 100 of these preliminary permits. Which one's going to sprout is anybody's guess sometime. And the, the Cotscook Bay project sort of got fast-tracked because it's your fault. Um, <laughs> we couldn't make any noise in the water after April 9th. So uh, that didn't really have anything to do with my area of influence except that we needed to conduct the public meetings before the environmental assessment came out. And if we hadn't done that, we would have been the last to the party. And we never want to do that because then we're the, we're the deciders and we're just contributing to the process. So one of the things in the future that that sort of uh, uh, brought to the attention, and we did mention Cobscook Bay last Friday, uh, is that we've got to communicate FERC Army Corps, NOAA, Coast Guard, all the agencies have to uh, be much more in a collaborative role as this goes on. So I, I see um, us getting better at it. You know, you just heard about some of the lessons learned on the hardware and you're learning more about the, uh, what's happening with the critters in the water. Uh, we're learning much more about how to deal with the uh, the federal regulatory process, and it is complex, but we're not shying away from it. Uh, I've got a slide that I won't show you, but it's it's every single regulation that applies to to uh, hydrokinetics in the United States, and who's Wait, responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why I'm not showing it. <laughs> I'll show it to you later. Um, it's it's uh, very difficult, but the only way this is going to work is for the federal state agencies to, that are regulating this to come together and understand who's got what, where there are gaps, fill them, where there are overlaps or inconsistencies, fix them. 
I just wanted to tell you we're in that conversation right now, and that's a much better place to be than where we were uh, a year or so ago. I'm Jim Beyer, and I came late to the party. Not last to the party, but late to the party. Um, I replaced Dana Murch. Um, and a couple of things struck me about this. One, it, it's really good to see ORPC and the university working together. Because as on a personal level, I don't feel a developer should have to be responsible for doing baseline research. I, I think that's kind of a university and a federal and a government process. A developer has to tell me as a regulator what the impacts or effects of their project is on on the environment. So having the university, because there is very, or before this, there was very little data on the resources in Cobbs Cook Bay. Um, so that, that I think is a unique partnership and, and a really healthy one. Um, you know, we had some issues. This is the very first one that we did in Maine. Um, so we had some bureaucratic issues that Herb and I had to work through. There was, we got a tweak into the legislature for the upcoming session to, to fix a problem that ORPC ran into with the timing of our process and the time frames I'm supposed to work under and then the time, as opposed to the time frames FERC works under. Um, but that was a, an exchange of a couple of emails, and we fixed that. Um, the other thing I can, I can reflect on is that <clears throat> I've been working for DEP for 30 plus years. When I first started, I was young and idealistic, and the, you know, it was, no was a pretty easy answer to give people. Um, and as um, the program has matured and I've matured, you know, it's nor, how do we get the yes now? And I think that's a, that's a big shift. And certainly for the rest of your projects, I mean, there, are, there will be times when we have to say no. Um, but that's not our thrust. Our thrust is to try and figure out what you guys need to do to make a viable project and how we do that without creating a bunch of endangered species along the way. Um, so. Thanks. I'm Linda Mercer. I am director of our, our research and monitoring programs uh, for the Department of Marine Resource, not the whole agency. <laughs> Wouldn't want the Sorry. responsibility. Uh, uh, Giving you more work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, uh, we, ORPC engaged early on with our agency in terms of what studies needed to be done. Um, I should step back and say our responsibility is for managing uh, the uh, marine resources and fisheries of the state of Maine. So out to three miles is our primarily our responsibility. And uh, part of that responsibility is also commenting on uh, environmental permits and projects like this. Um, we're a commenting agency. We comment to FERC. We comment to the Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, so we don't actually have responsibility for uh, issuing permits or anything like that. But um, knowing uh, what we did know about Cobbs Cook Bay and what we didn't know, which was a lot more really, um, it's very exciting for me to see what the main tidal power initiative is accomplishing in terms of gathering information because you don't always see, I think, such a comprehensive data collection program as we're seeing with this project. I think that is uh, what makes this very different than other projects I've seen um, and very refreshing to see that. It's difficult to com provide comments on what the impacts might be to uh, fish and fisheries. Uh, we know a lot more about the fisheries in Cups Cook Bay. We're very familiar with the scallop and urchin fisheries, the lobster fishery, periwinkle fishing, and all of the other types of fisheries clamming that are going on up here. But we don't have a lot of information on the resources up here. Um, it's the far eastern part of the state. Our monitoring programs are along the coast pretty much. We have a trawl survey twice a year that goes all the way to uh, the Canadian border, but it doesn't get inshore. So we, there's been very little fisheries work done inshore. The uh, great study that the Nature Conservancy um, found funding for through the Mellon 
Foundation a few year, number of years ago now was great, but didn't get into actual um, uh, fish species and all. So we're learning so much from this project that's going to help us make much more informed decisions along the way on um, what's, a, what's an acceptable level of um, impact. We don't know what that really is at this point. So um, I look forward to seeing the, uh, the results of the monitoring efforts that are being done. I think that will help us a lot for this project and future projects like this. Um, the other thing I've always been struck by with this project is the amount of outreach to stakeholders, certainly. The amount of outreach to the fishing community around the Copsco Bay area has been, I think, very valuable. You see so many projects come up um, that just say, ah, oh, we're proposing to do this and uh, sort of try to move forward with them and often hit a brick wall trying to do it that way and that hasn't happened with this project. So I think the collaborative efforts have been hugely important in uh, in the progress that's been made with title development. Okay, well, I wanted to open it up um, to all of you and see if there were any questions um, from the audience who's been. I don't. Do they need the mic? Actually, there were people question. Just real. Uh, you you mentioned fisheries. What about mammals like, for instance, seals and waterfowl? Um, particularly, my question is spawned from last year, um, the real decrease in the, in the harbor seals that we noticed as um, property owners on one of the estuary moose cove down, down east here. <laughs> and uh, there was a real, real decline of the seal population during mating season, which has just somewhat ended. It's usually like late August. This is only from observation, not from any, you know, real background on, on the seal population, but I don't know if anyone would comment on that. If there was any impact whatsoever, or if, there's, if that's even been um, looked at. Um, I really can't answer your question, because what I do for NOAA is, is, is specifically fish, but I do know that ORPC worked with our headquarters uh, in Silver Springs, and they obtained an incidental harassment authorization and I don't think there's any anticipation of any, any lethal interactions with this device, and I don't believe there have been uh, any uh, observed or documented to date. So um, I, I can't speak to what you've observed, but I, I do know that uh, ORPC went through the, all the proper authorities, uh, and it was an evaluation to determine whether it would be any And it's ongoing, yeah. And it's ongoing. Our, yeah. our Marine Mammal Observing Program uh, goes the full length of our permit. So we, we count noses, if you will, um, uh, at, the, at the project in, in and around the project site and are working with the New England Aquarium and the consortium that looks at marine mammals uh, in, this, in this region. So we are working with the pros from Dover, if you will, on, on marine mammals. And they also conducted some pre-installation monitoring uh, just to establish a baseline uh, and then we can from then determine whether they're were any changes, uh, so they've been very forthright in doing some of the necessary studies uh, and, and got all the necessary authorizations. It's difficult for it was. Jessica, he had a, a this gentleman here uh, had a question earlier in the in the day about uh, what the threshold would be oh, to yeah. take one out, yeah. and. I'll tell you when I see it, okay? Because we haven't, we have. Oh, if you kill twenty fish, you're, you you got to pull the thing out. We haven't done anything like that. Um, so, to answer that question is no, there is no set threshold, um, and, and it's more. That's the beauty of adaptive management is we'll we'll look and we'll see. Okay, are they having an impact? Well, can they alter their operation somehow so that they're not having that impact or to reduce that impact? Or is there some other technique? Um, that's why the ongoing monitoring is, is there. <clears throat> well, I was going to ask, um, we just, we'll, be having um, a small sites panel next, so we'll probably learn more about it. But wondering what you may see 
Um, so the only experience we have so far is with a larger project. Um, what you might see if somebody is trying to develop a project on a smaller scale, how you see that differently and perhaps what advice you may give. And this may tap into your marine spatial planning, Ron, so I might give that to you on how we can work at different scales and what advice you may have. Um, obviously the larger projects have more impact for, for my world of work, which is uh, navigational freedom. Can vessels go where they historically have gone? Uh, navigational safety, safety of the installed infrastructure. Um, we want to uh, try to protect that. And then uh, just safety from the standpoint of um, vessels dragging anchor over things like the export cable, uh, divers in the water that, I don't know how they suffer compared to seals, probably not real great. Um, for smaller scale, um, one of the things that's happening, and, and this region has some, uh, some people who are far ahead of the rest of the country, Gulf of Maine uh, Research Institute, the uh, Northeast Regional Ocean Council, Niracus, uh, all are in this this conversation on marine spatial planning. And a lot of what they do has very good uh, data closer to shore where smaller uh, hydrokinetic devices may be placed. And there are some data portals that are getting better um, to provide that data. So I think uh, that would be a good place to start. Um, you know, I don't think there's, there's not deep draft concerns from my standpoint, less navigational uh, safety problems, but you, in miniature you still have all the same, same things. I can, I... When I approach a project, I, I typically, mm -hmm. for the most part, assume that the level of impacts are typically commensurate with the scale and scope of the project. And um, if it's a t small project, typically we recognize that they have smaller resources and, and the, the level and intensity of environmental monitoring should be commensurate with the size of, this, of that project. So you might have a single homeowner that wants just to put in a little Alaskan type turbine. Obviously the scale and scope of that impact would be significantly less. You might have somebody much greater resources than ORPC had with a huge project. And, and because we have to understand what those consequences would be, environmental impacts, we, I would expect those studies could even be greater than, than what ORPC did. Up. But my strategy is to typically approach it based upon the size and scale of the project so that, um, you know, uh, and, and we really work to, as, as, as Jim said, to, to get to yes. And, and that's how I approach it. Once a small-scale uh, operator has found a potential site, get in touch with us early, okay? Um, and get consultation, contact the resource agencies um, to find out if there's, you know, what what resources might be there. Um, so, and. The resource agencies and the at the state and federal level have gotten much better at talking to each other in the last few years than we used to be. So. One one case in point uh, occurred in Rhode Island, and it was uh, for a wave device. But uh, Grover Fugate, who was the one of the authors of the Rhode Island Special Area Management Plan, which is one of the best ocean plans in the in the country, very thorough. Came, he coined a phrase, you've got to identify those truly stupid places to put anything. And this wave device was going to be in a swimming area. I don't know how they thought that would ever work. <laughs> so uh, I think in service to the small uh, MHK uh, people, if you can uh, sort of click off those places, nah, it looks good, but you know, it'll never work. You know, it, that, that's a service to everybody. It doesn't want to waste time and money on this. I don't think I have a lot to add except 
I, I agree with the comments that have been made. Come to the agencies. Uh, we often have information that might be useful uh, so that you don't have to do extensive studies. And hopefully we're translating information from one project to the next, too, in terms of what we do need to, to know to, to evaluate things. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Just, just a quick comment. Having come from Massachusetts and being uh, uh, part of the regulatory uh, regime, both from uh, uh, the developer side of a major marina and then also being the secretariat on the uh, environmental side. Uh, I'm really encouraged and pleased of uh, uh, your thoughts Jim, about uh, your change in culture about saying yes. One of the things that was a real problem in Massachusetts, and I was on the developer side at that point, was the change from the, uh, what was known as the Department of Environmental Quality Engineering <coughs> to the Department of Environmental Protection. And that changed the culture in the wrong direction because prior to that it was quality engineering that was encouraged by the, uh, by the regulatory community to make it work. And then it went to a just no agency and it's just been uh, an uphill fight. And it's, I think it's great to hear all of you uh, look at it as in a much more positive sense, but I think you get better projects that way. I would love to hear Kurt's perspective. <laughs> and I think you also hear Kurt's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Kurt. Kurt, please go up. <laughs> you go past five, you're paying for cocktails. <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting to sit here and listen to some of this because we've all faced each other in one way, shape, or form uh, through a 40 years of certainly my career. And I think the one thing that uh, I would take away from this whole experience is that the adaptive management, the, uh, the ability to even use adaptive management between ourselves and the DEP and FERC and, and all the rest of these agents and the people that sit around the table and say, okay, we've got to, we've got to deal with this. How many fish are you going to chop up and, before we get to stop this thing? Just the, that as a, as a concept, this is throwing command and control out the window and let's really sit down together and figure out what's the right thing to do. I have never been on a project where it's actually, that's actually been allowed to happen. So. There's, it's really a change. It's very refreshing. <laughs> it's nice to not just have it commanding. How many fish can you kill? How many seals can you take? It's, it's not that at all. It's what's the right thing to do here? And, and, and so the, the thing that I take away from what this experience has taught me is that there has been a change. There has been a change. Maine sat there and signs an MOU with FERC to let you guys all talk together. And, and it's... I've never, never, and I've done nuclear power plants before. That just has not happened, but it, it's happened for this project. So I think we're learning. Right? We're maturing as as a society, and we're and it's you know it's e it's so easy to say no. It was so easy to say no. It's a hell of a lot more work to sit down and figure out what's the right answer. So I think we're actually taking that on as a society, and I and, and I think that's that's the the one thing that I'd like to take you guys to take away from the regulatory part. This is, this is cooperative. This is working together. You pull everybody's, you bring the right science to the table and you bring the community to the table and you bring all the people's wants and needs and then figure out what's the right way to do this. So that's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in that spirit of learning, collaboration, and coordination, and adaptive management, I, I thank you all very much. And um, I think we'll hear just lastly from the small sites panel, and um, perhaps they can reflect on this as well. So, thank you.